Okay, so y'all, the next uh, topic for respiratory system gas exchanges between the blood and the lungs and the blood and your tissues. Now, this is where in your textbook things may start looking kind of scary, and it's not really quite as scary as it needs to look. So um, just kind of bear with me as we go through some of this information. Okay, the first thing you guys need to know is, all right, you got something like air, for example. That is a mixture of different gases. You guys have learned that before. Okay, so you've got nitrogen gas into, uh, which is two nitrogen atoms linked together. You've got oxygen gas, carbon dioxide gas. You've actually got water vapor, water in a gaseous form um, that's present in the air as well. And, um, the two gases, obviously, that we're the most concerned with for respiration, O2 and CO2. So when we talk about the, um, the atmospheric air pressure, measuring that, and it's 760 millimeters of mercury, which, by the way, that's, um, I'm not, not going to do the math, but like when you watch the weather, they give you the barometric pressure in inches. So like, you know, it, the barometric pressure is 30.26 inches and in rising or falling. And um, for the purposes of A and P here, though, we're looking at these measurements in um, millimeters rather than inches. So it's metric system versus English system. So but we are actually talking about the same uh, the same types of measurements. Okay, then, so you have different gases in the air, and then how much are individual gases contributing to this overall pressure? Those are called those gases partial pressures. So and if you look, if the total is 760 for air, um, 597 millimeters of that pressure is coming from nitrogen gas, 159 from oxygen gas, and uh, CO2.3 and water vapor about 3.7 and then those add up to 760. Now if you look at the air down in the alveoli of your lungs things are a little bit different because uh, you know we're releasing all this CO2 all the time and the oxygen that we take in gets absorbed really quickly into the capillaries so the numbers are not going to quite be the same as they are out here in the open air. <clears throat> but if you look inside uh, the alveoli in the lungs the partial pressure of O2 is 104, and CO2, it's about 40. So don't be scared about partial pressures. Just think when you see those numbers, that is the amount of oxygen gas or carbon dioxide gas present in a particular location. Okay, now what might be a little bit more difficult to think about is you can also use these partial pressure values to um, to indicate the amount of these gases that are present in fluids like your tissue fluids and your blood as well so and I know that can can be a little abstract to think about but um, you know don't worry about it just think about the millimeters of mercury these partial pressures that you're seeing it's just representing the amount of oxygen gas or carbon dioxide and you will be fine for uh, the purposes of studying the respiratory system Okay, so if you compare, you know, what makes oxygen gas flow from the air sacs in your lungs into the capillaries that surround those alveoli? Well, it's because there's more oxygen gas inside the air of the alveoli than you have in that deoxygenated blood that's coming in to those capillary beds that surround the alveoli. By the way, partial pressure is symbolized by a capital P, so this means partial pressure O2 oxygen gas, or down here, the big P, partial pressure of carbon dioxide gas that's present. And again, gases can be present in air or in fluids. They get dissolved in fluids. All right, so if you compare, the air in the alveoli has a partial pressure of oxygen gas of 104 millimeters of mercury. The venous blood, it is... 40 millimeters of mercury. I just realized that really should be arterial blood because you're bringing in the blood through the uh, 
and I got this from the textbook. So that should actually be arterial blood technically because it's the pulmonary arteries that are bringing in that deoxygenated blood. So just keep that in mind. But we're, we're thinking about what is the partial pressure of oxygen gas uh, inside the blood that's coming into these capillary beds in blue here. So that should be, that's around 40 millimeters of mercury and in the air it's 104. Well, gases diffuse, molecules diffuse from places where they're more concentrated to less. So they're going to move from uh, 104 inside the air sacs towards where there's a value of 40. So this happens very, very quickly. So the O2 moves into the blood. The CO2, it's reversed. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the air inside the alveoli is 40. And it's 45 in the blood. So the difference is not nearly as striking as it is for oxygen gas. But nevertheless, which way is the CO2 going to want to move? It's going to move from where there's more of it towards where there's less by diffusion. So the CO2 is going to move out of the blood and into the air sacs. Okay, and again, this really should be more, this should be arteriolar blood when we're thinking about the pulmonary circuit. Okay. Um, and we've talked about that respiratory membrane already and how thin it is. 0.5 to 1 micrometer thick in some instances. But uh, this is kind of an interesting stat from your textbook. If you think about the total surface area of all of the respiratory membrane, the linings of all of those alveoli uh, throughout all of your lungs, if you could measure that surface area, iron them all out individually, it would be 40 times the surface area of your skin. Um, anything that thickens that respiratory membrane, it has to be super, super thin to allow the O2 and the CO2 gases to diffuse properly. Anything that makes that get thicker, that's going to limit the ability of gas exchange to take place. So you're not going to be able to oxygenate your blood properly that's passing through those pulmonary capillaries. So what can hap what can cause that? Um, anytime you have fluid inside the lungs, um, such as if you're drowning, for example, or if they're edematous, you have edema, swelling going on because you've got some kind of inflammation occurring, or um, heart failure. You know, when heart failure takes place, your you have a backflow of blood pressure into those pulmonary capillaries and they'll squeeze out excess fluids um, into the spaces surrounding those air sacs and that can cause those little thin air sacs to burst and you wind up with fluid moving inside your lungs that way. So anything like that that reduces the total surface area or the um, or reduces or or, or increases the thickness, anything like that, like swelling, can cause you problems with gas exchange. A reduction in surface area, how do you lose? That just basically means you're losing some of your alveoli because they wind up dying or they get damaged or they get converted over to scar tissue. And that is what happens with emphysema, that condition, when that develops. You, just, you lose your alveoli because so many of them are damaged. Okay, so that process that we just talked about, that's called external respiration, where you have the gas exchange around the alveoli and the lungs, and that's what we saw here um, in more detail a few minutes ago. Now, when you get to your tissues down here, the opposite is happening. Okay, so you have more oxygen gas in your blood. The partial pressure of O2 in your blood um, after it leaves the lungs goes up to 95 in your tissue fluids, it's about 40 because your cells have used the oxygen gas. They've used it up for cellular respiration. So when the blood moves through the capillaries that surround your tissues, O2 is going to move from where it's 95 towards where it's 40. So it's going to diffuse into your tissues. The opposite happens with CO2. So these cells in your tissues have been given off CO2 
due to cellular respiration. So the partial pressure of CO2 in your tissue fluids will be about 45, 46, and it's going to move into the bloodstream, into the blood in those capillaries, because there your partial pressure is sitting at about 40. Now the blood travels back to the heart and then from the heart to the lungs and you do the external respiration again. The CO2 moves out, oxygen gas moves back in. So it's really driven by the differences in these partial pressures, the amount of oxygen gas and CO2 that you have in your bloodstream versus the air in the alveoli or the the partial pressures of those gases that are present in your tissue fluids. Okay, how is oxygen gas transported to your tissues? Okay, so oxygen gas O2 is a molecule. It's two oxygen atoms linked together. Now you guys have already heard some of this before with cardiovascular. It's uh, Most of it winds up being transported inside your red blood cells because these are basically just little sacs that are full of hemoglobin proteins and those have iron atoms inside them that uh, help bind the oxygen gas molecules. So about 98.5 percent of the oxygen gas in your blood is actually inside your red blood cells and attached to hemoglobin. But about 1.5 gases can dissolve in fluids. That's how we want it with things like carbonated beverages. About 1.5% of the oxygen gas is dissolved in your plasma, your blood fluid. Um, HB, that's an abbreviation for hemoglobin. Each hemoglobin protein can bind to four, one, two, three, four, the little blue spheres that you see here, oxygen gas molecules. Um, and if a hemoglobin protein is has four oxygen gas molecules attached, it's said to be saturated. It doesn't have to be saturated. There could be three. There could be two. And um, in fact, what happens is when O2 moves from these red blood cells and into your tissue fluids, um, the oxygen gas molecules come off of the hemoglobin and dissolve in, uh, and then diffuse into those tissue fluids. So you don't necessarily have to have all four coming off of one hemoglobin. A single hemoglobin might lose one or two rather than all four. So in fact, when, you, um, when oxygen gas molecules are unloaded from the hemoglobin and into the uh, tissue fluids that are surrounding the capillaries, only about 20 to 25 percent of those come off under normal circumstances. However, let's say you need to oxygenate your tissues um, to greater levels, like let's say you're, uh, you're exercising, for example. Um, when you, if you're exercising, you're using up more oxygen gas in your skeletal muscles and, and some other tissues as well, because they're doing more cellular respiration. They got to make more ATP. They consume that that oxygen gas. That makes the oxygen gas levels drop within the tissue fluids that are um, that those capillaries are serving. So that will actually trigger more oxygen gas to come off of the hemoglobin in your red blood cells to supply those tissues with more oxygen gas. So that's a homeostasis type thing that's going on. In fact, you may not even need to at first, you know, if you have some tissues that are just a little low on oxygen gas, um, you may not need to increase your breathing rate or your cardiac outputs um, in order to get more oxygen gas to those tissues because you're always carrying around some extra attached to your hemoglobin. Um, some other things that can make oxygen gas come off of your hemoglobin molecules more easily are things like high temperature. Well, that's good because uh, what happens to you when you're exercising or when you're severely stressed and you wind up needing more oxygen gas in your tissues, your body temperature will go up. If you're doing more cellular respiration, you're generating more heat from breaking down nutrients. So high temperature then, that's an indicator that, hey, we need some more oxygen gas over here in these tissues. The temperature has gone up. The cells must be doing cellular respiration really, really uh doing a whole lot of cellular respiration, we got to provide them with more O2 gas. Low pH 
low pH can be an indication that you've got um, excess carbon dioxide that's building up in tissue fluids. That's another indicator of cellular respiration. Cellular respiration gives off CO2 as a waste and CO2, excess CO2 causes the pH of your body fluids to go down. We'll be seeing more of that in just a few minutes. This diagram from your textbook shows what happens um, to tissues in different states. So this is the percent of O2 saturation of hemoglobin in your red blood cells. All right, so if it's 100%, that means all of the hemoglobin molecules have four oxygen gas molecules attached. You know, if it's a 50%, on average, the hemoglobin molecules have two attached. So if you're looking in your lungs, O2 saturation of hemoglobin is going to be near 100% because that's where your blood is being oxygenated. But if you look um, when the blood passes through capillaries around resting tissues, that saturation is going to drop off to about 75%. About 25% 20, about of the oxygen gas molecules will be unloaded. But if you look in exercising tissues that are consuming a lot of oxygen gas, you're going to unload more of your oxygen gas from the hemoglobin and into those tissues. So your percent saturation will go down to about 25%. Um, so again, some factors that increase O2 release by hemoglobin. So a lot of these things are going to be um, recurring themes from when you did cardiovascular. And hopefully some of these physiology concepts are starting to sound pretty familiar to you. Um, all right, so when, you're, when cells break down glucose and other nutrients, they do cellular respiration. Okay, they give off carbon dioxide as a waste, which is going to make the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in your tissue fluids go up. Okay, and it's also, therefore, then that's also that excess CO2 is going to move into your bloodstream. So the partial pressure in your bloodstream is going to go up as well. And uh, you're, we're going to see shortly that CO2, start thinking about CO2 as functioning like an acid in your body fluids. And that will help you with some of the concepts here that are coming at the uh, end of the semester. So hydrogen ions, the more hydrogen ions you have, your, that means your body flu, fluids are more acidic, pH is lower. If you have few, excuse me, if you have fewer hydrogen ions, <coughs> excuse me, your pH goes up. That's an alkaline type condition. <clears throat> hydrogen ions will go up due to an increase in metabolism, cellular respiration. <clears throat> All right, so acidic pH, declining pH, actually causes oxygen gas molecules to come off of hemoglobin more easily because acidic pH is an indication that tissues are being very, very metabolically active and they need more oxygen gas. And we've already talked about increasing temperatures and heat production. <clears throat> Okay, a homeostatic imbalance. So you heard about hypoxia before probably when you covered the cardiovascular system. What does that term mean? Hypoxia, if a tissue is hypoxic, it just means it's not receiving um, adequate oxygen gas delivery. Hypo, referring to low. Oxia here, referring to oxygen. That can be caused by any number of things, many of which you've talked about before. Um, anemia, having too few red blood cells, if you don't make hemoglobin properly, uh, anything that's blocking circulation, blocking blood flow, that's also called ischemia, um, I-S-C-H-E-M-I-A, that's going to cause hypoxia in the tissues served by those blood vessels. There are metabolic poisons that can cause hypoxia. Carbon monoxide poisoning, for example, you know, we've all heard of people dying due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide, what it does, it actually has a strong affinity for hemoglobin. That means, affinity means that they're, you know, how strongly attracted are they? Hemoglobin and carbon monoxide are more strongly attracted to each other than hemoglobin and oxygen gas. 
So if you breathe in carbon monoxide, it starts taking up all of those slots on hemoglobin, and then there are no slots for oxygen gas, and you wind up dying because your cells don't get their oxygen gas. And of course, pulmonary diseases of various kinds can cause hypoxia as well. Okay, what about carbon dioxide? How is that transported around in the bloodstream? Okay, so it's not, most of it does not wind up getting attached to hemoglobin. Some of it does, and when hemoglobin is attached to carbon dioxide, it's actually called carbaminohemoglobin. Um, CO2 dissolves fairly well in, in your blood plasma, so about 7 to 10% of CO2 gas molecules just dissolve in your blood fluids. But about 70% actually get transported uh, within bicarbonate ions. So I know that sounds kind of strange, but if you look at what a bicarbonate ion is, it's HCO3. So you got CO2 there, but you've just added an extra hydrogen and an extra oxygen to make HCO3, which is a bicarbonate, that's the name of that, and it has a negative charge. So that's why it's called a bicarbonate ion. So most CO2 that your cells give off from cellular respiration winds up in these ions. And so why does that happen? Now here's a little chemical equation that you're gonna see um, many times. So you're gonna see it here at, at the end of Biology 202 and you're gonna see it in nursing as well. Try not to get too scared by it, but at first it's, um, it takes a little bit of change in thinking. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, start thinking about carbon dioxide functioning like an acid. If you have more of it around, the pH of your body fluids is going to go down because acids lower your pH. If you have less of it around, like if your cells are not producing as much of it, um, you have less acid, so the pH of your body fluids goes up, it becomes more alkaline. So why is this? Well, what happens is when your cells give off carbon dioxide, they very quickly react with water molecules. <clears throat> so CO2 and H2O are put together, and that gives you a molecule called H2CO3. So this is called carbonic acid. This is an acid. Acids if you guys remember, those are um, compounds that tend to give off hydrogen ions. Or when they're present in a fluid, they release these hydrogen ions, they break apart, and they give off a hydrogen ion, and then you've got the leftover portion of the acid remaining. And hydrogen ions are very chemically reactive. Okay, and when you we talk about pH, that's actually a measurement of the concentration of these in the body fluid. So if you have more of them, conditions are becoming more acidic. If you have fewer of them, conditions are becoming more alkaline. And unfortunately, the numbers don't match up. So as you become more acidic, you have more hydrogen ions, but your pH number goes down. If you're becoming more alkaline, you have fewer hydrogen ions, your pH value is going up. So you just have to kind of keep that in mind as well. Okay, so carbonic acid, when that forms from CO2 and water, that pretty quickly breaks apart and it releases hydrogen ions. And then the leftover you have are these bicarbonate ions. So I just told you that most CO2 given off by your cells is transported in your blood as part of these bicarbonate ions. <clears throat> Notice that these arrows here show you these are chemical reactions, but the arrows are pointing in both directions. That's because these chemical reactions can go in both directions, which that's the part that's kind of hard to get used to thinking about. So CO2 and water can combine to form carbonic acid, but carbonic acid can also split apart and go this way and form water and CO2. Carbonic acid can split apart and release a hydrogen ion and this bicarbonate ion, but these two can also be put back together to make carbonic acid. So these things go back and forth, and the whole thing goes back and forth. 
And what typically drives it is if you have a lot of CO2, things tend to move in this direction. If you have less CO2 and you've got lots of these guys and lots of hydrogen ions around, things tend to move backward in that direction. So it's kind of like a seesaw, depending on your, you know, how much of your of these guys and these guys you have in your body fluids. These chemical reactions that you see here, um, they typically occur mainly in red blood cells. That's where they happen the most efficiently because red blood cells have enzymes called carbonic and hydrase enzymes that actually catalyze or make the chemical reaction happen. Uh, this is kind of a complicated looking diagram from your textbook and it's showing you what happens with oxygen release and carbon dioxide pickup in your tissues. So here you've got one little red blood cell and what they're showing you here is that yeah you got some O2 dissolved in your plasma that's going to diffuse over here into your tissues. Most of the oxygen gas is bound to hemoglobin Hb and it gets released off of the hemoglobin, moves over here into the tissue fluids. <clears throat> and then what about picking up the carbon dioxide waste from your tissues? Okay, so some of that's just going to move into your plasma of your blood, the fluid portion, and dissolve. <clears throat> Some of it will move in and react with water and form carbonic acid, which will break apart into bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions, just as I just showed you. And so some of that can just happen spontaneously without enzymes. Um, but the bulk of it is going to move into your red blood cells. And the red blood cells have enzymes that make that first reaction to generate the carbonic acid happen really, really quickly and then these will break apart and form those carbonic um, carbonate, bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. And again, so the more CO2 you have, the more of these guys you have around. The more of these guys you have around, your pH of your body fluids drops. They become more acidic. So that's why I was telling you, you know, just kind of get used to thinking about the more CO2 you have around, the pH of your body fluids will go down. And you guys already know that the pH of your body fluids has to remain in a, in a fairly, um, a very narrow range of 7.35 to 7.45. This last little line here, they're just showing you that some of the CO2 does become connected to or bonds to hemoglobin and becomes carbamino hemoglobin. Okay, now over in your lungs, around the respiratory membrane, so now we're in a capillary, there's a red blood cell in a capillary surrounding an alveolus, alveolus, and here's the air in the alveolus. It's really the opposite is happening. So they're showing you oxygen gas moving from the alveolus into your bloodstream. A little bit gets dissolved in the plasma. Most of it winds up bonding to hemoglobin. Um, now what happens to the CO2? So you've got all these bicarbonate ions we were talking about that are floating around now in your plasma and they're really storing the CO2 that came from your tissue cells. Well, they diffuse back into your red blood cells. And remember how I was talking about that chemical reaction can operate in reverse. So those carbonic and hydrase enzymes will actually, once the hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions combine back together, and form carbonic acid, these enzymes will break them apart. And so now you have freed the CO2 that was originally in here. It's been freed and it can now diffuse out of the red blood cells and the bloodstream and back into those little air spaces there in the lungs. So you got this back and forth that can take place. Y'all, this chloride shift, if you're seeing that on the diagram in your textbooks, what that means Okay, so if a bicarbonate ion that has a negative charge, if it moves inside a red blood cell, a red blood cell needs to maintain its electrical charge. So if a negative charge moves in, a negative charge needs to move out. And the, the negatively charged ion that moves out is a chloride ion. And the same thing happens in reverse around your tissues. So it's just an exchange of two different ions that have, the, that have negative charges to help maintain electrical charge. 
All right, I'm going to cut this video lecture off here, and then we will talk about the influence of carbon dioxide on your blood pH on the next lecture video clip.